Hello space fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, astronomers using ESO telescopes and other facilities have found clear evidence of a planet orbiting the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri. And in response to a request from a Space Fan News Patreon patron, an update on ESA's Euclid mission to study the dark universe. And finally, astronomers discover a galaxy made up almost entirely of dark matter. By now you've all heard the big news that astronomers at the European Southern Observatory have confirmed the existence of an Earth-sized exoplanet around the closest star system to Earth, Proxima Centauri. Using years of data from the HARPS and UVES instruments mounted on a 3.6 meter telescope in La Silla, Chile, along with instruments from all over the world, astronomers confirmed the existence of the exoplanet that they had suspected was there for quite some time. Known as Proxima Centauri b, it's 1.3 times the mass of our Earth. Also, it's rocky. Also, it goes around its host star in 11.2 days. Now, that's its year, folks. Also, it may have an atmosphere. Also, it orbits about 7 million kilometers from its star, which puts it in the coveted habitable zone of Proxima Centauri, which means that, yes, Virginia, liquid water can exist there if it has any. <laughs> now, because Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star, planets can get much closer to them and still have liquid water on them than they could if, they, like our Sun, or for example, Mercury. Now, Proxima Centauri b is closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun, so that gives you some idea how much cooler a red dwarf is compared to our Sun. Now, they found this planet using the radial velocity method, something I've told you about many times that measures the shifting of the spectral lines in a spectrograph as the star is pulled around by orbiting planets. This is a good technique for finding small planets next to comparatively large stars, and the amount of the wobble is a good indicator of how massive the planet might be. Now, since 2013, astronomers had suspected there was something around this star, because they had seen the evidence of a small wobble using HARPS way back then, but they needed more observations to confirm it. Now, just because a star is wobbling doesn't mean it has planets around it. Other things can cause a star to wobble. There can be stellar activity, bursts, flares, and other variable activity that can also cause a star to move back and forth slightly. Now, even though the 2013 detection wasn't very convincing, Astronomers kind of had a good hunch that there was mo that the motion that they were seeing was due to a planet being there. So the first thing they wanted to do was rule out there was any stellar activity in the star, and they used instruments from other facilities around the world that looked closely at brightness variability and stellar seismology. Since Proxima Centauri seemed stable, they became more confident that the wobble was due to an orbiting planet. Working with a group of astronomers is a project called Pale Red Dot, and this is kind of a play on Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, which is it, they're interested in looking at the closest stars near Earth to try and find exoplanets there, and they began planning for more observations of Proxima Centauri using ESO's HARPS instrument. They plan to look at the system and measure the spectrum for 60 days from mid-January this year until April 2016. So this announcement and some papers that was published in Nature and Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal this week are the result of those observations. The papers state that the possibility of liquid water cannot be ruled out and receives an amount of energy from the central star that is about two-thirds of that received by Earth from the Sun. <laughs> but of course it's not that simple, is it? I've been following exoplanet research long enough and talked with enough astronomers on the topic of habitability that I'm starting to get to a place where I'm calling them on the whole Earth-like label thing. Sure, Proxima Centauri b is 1.3 times the mass of the Earth. Very close, to be sure. Also, having an atmosphere is good, and having a temperature that can allow for liquid water is great. But that's kind of where the similarities end. Remember, I said it orbits 7 million kilometers from the star? Well, that probably means that the planet is tidally locked, which means one side of the planet always faces the star and the other side is always pointed away. And that's not very Earth-like. I mean, what would something like that do to the global climate? And we also have absolutely no idea what the atmosphere is made of or how thick it is. And, well, that's kind of important as well. And what's more, while red dwarf stars are very stable and last for trillions of years, they also let out a lot of high-energy radiation, like X-rays and extreme ultraviolet. So unless this planet has a serious magnetosphere to protect any life that might be there, 
things can be problematic. Astronomers estimate that Proxima Centauri b gets 60 times more energy radiation from its star than the Earth gets from the Sun. They also estimate that any atmosphere that might be there would be subject to a lot of stress early in the life of the star, so much so that an entire ocean's worth of water could have been lost in the first 100 to 200 million years after formation. And so far as anyone knows, the entire atmosphere may have been ripped away by now. So the Earth-like label only gets you so far, and we need to remember that there are a host of other things that need to go right if we are to compare other worlds around other stars to the Earth and its habitability. Regardless though, no matter what the details of what Proxima Centauri b turns out to be, the fact is we won't find a closer planet around another star anywhere. This is the closest star system to us, and the fact that it has planets is very comforting. I don't think there is anything all of us would like more than to learn there are other worlds like ours that we can imagine are out there and maybe even travel to someday. Which is precisely what Breakthrough Starshot is trying to do. They want to send tiny ultralight nanocraft at relativistic speeds to the nearest stars. And I told you about that in SFN 160, so click here. I think it's up there, <laughs> if you want to catch up on what they're doing. Next, this story was suggested by a Space Fan News Patreon patron who wanted to learn more about ESA's Euclid mission. Euclid is a European Space Agency mission designed to map the geometry of the dark universe, which includes dark matter and dark energy. Now, it will do this by carefully measuring the shapes and redshifts of galaxies and clusters of galaxies all over the universe out to redshifts of about z equals 2, which is during a time when the universe was about 10 billion years old. This means it will look at the entire dark history of the universe for the last 3.7 billion years or so. Now this is important because astronomers know that there is about five times more matter in the universe than what we can see, and they're calling that dark matter. They also know that something is causing the universe to accelerate as it expands, and to match the observations of what they see happening, they estimate that three quarters of the universe is made up of whatever that is, and they're calling that dark energy. So between dark matter and dark energy, we don't know what makes up 95% of the cosmos. That is so weird. Okay, so back to Euclid. Euclid will map the large-scale structure of the universe over the entire extragalactic sky, or half the full sky excluding the regions dominated by the stars in our Milky Way. This means that it will look straight up out of the plane of our galaxy so it can get a clear view of everything else that's out there. And as I said, it will measure galaxies out to redshifts of about two, which corresponds to a look back time of about 10 billion years. This time period is important because it covers the period over which astronomers think dark energy accelerated the expansion of the universe. Okay, now stick with me here. It will measure the geometry of the dark universe using two methods. First, weak gravitational lensing, which are small, tiny distortions of galaxy images by stuff that's in between us and the galaxy. And this will give astronomers a handle on dark matter. And second, by measuring something called baryon acoustic oscillations, these are wiggle patterns imprinted in galaxy clusters which provide a standard ruler to measure dark energy and the expansion of the universe at different times in our past. This will provide a look at the topology of where the dark energy is in the universe. So what's the status on the mission? Well, in 2012, astronomers decided on what instruments they wanted on board, and they picked the contractor to build the satellite. So in 2015, Euclid passed its preliminary design review, which was very important because it provided confidence that the spacecraft and the payload can be built, as well as that the science can be done. So right now, they are building and assembling everything. Launch is planned for 2020, and it will be launched on a Soyuz ST-21B launch vehicle from French Guiana. And it will end up at every space telescope's favorite resort spot, the L2 point, <laughs> 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, where it will rub shoulders with the James Webb Space Telescope, which should already be waiting there and taking observations. I will keep you posted. <laughs> Finally, astronomers using the 10-meter Keck-2 telescope have found that what they think is a galaxy made up almost entirely of dark matter. 99.99% dark matter, to be more precise. Now, studying dark matter is irritating enough because it doesn't have the good manners to interact with us in any way. But they infer its existence by looking at the effect it has on things we can see, like rotating galaxies and 
Up until these observations, astronomers always thought that the distribution of dark matter to normal matter was more or less the same as galaxies form. Well, that went out the window this week with the discovery of a galaxy called Dragonfly 44, which is causing problems with current theories of galaxy formation. Dragonfly 44 is a very massive galaxy, roughly the same mass as the Milky Way, but it has the opposite structure and number of stars. This galaxy has only about one one hundredth of the number of stars as the Milky Way, but it still has the same mass. And there also doesn't appear to be a nice spiral structure to it like our galaxy has either. Dragonfly 44 gets its name from the instrument used to observe it. Astronomers from Keck assembled a bunch of telephoto lenses into an array, which makes them look like a, the eyes of an insect, and they do this so that it can gather more light. When they pointed Dragonfly at the Coma Cluster of Galaxies some 320 million light years away, they detected 47 faint smudges. These were galaxies that could be at least as large as the Milky Way, 100,000 light years across. The thing is, they were way too dim. They were glowing like dwarf galaxies. The Coma Cluster is immense, and astronomers have known for a long time that the galaxies inside of it were massive, so something weird was going on. They thought that one of two things was going on. Either these galaxies are tightly bound by dark matter, or the Coma Cluster is ripping them to shreds. To find out which it was, they took spectra from the 10-meter Keck 2 telescope, which allowed the team to track how fast the few stars that they could see were traveling. The faster the speed of the stars, the more massive the galaxy. The stars clocked in at 47 kilometers per second, making Dragonfly 44 roughly a trillion times more massive than the Sun. With so few stars, and therefore normal matter, that meant that it must contain 99.99% dark matter to hold itself together, which is a much higher percentage than the universe at large. All of this means that for any given galaxy or cluster of galaxies, the amount of dark matter found inside can vary considerably. Apparently, dark matter can do whatever it wants and clump however it wants in galaxy clusters. Dark matter wins once again. Well, that's it for this week, space fans. Thanks to all Patreon patrons who continue to make SFN possible. I couldn't do this without you. Thank all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up.